Are you newer to playing the piano and understanding key signatures and you can't keep it straight in your head what a key is and a key signature is and what playing in D major or D minor means and all that stuff. It's just really confusing for you. Well, today I'm going to give you a ground floor look at what key signatures are and what they look like on the staff. And I'm also going to give you some additional tips on how to figure out what key you're in given a certain key signature. So uh, let's get right on to the lesson. Okay, the first topic tonight is many students get confused when they try to keep keys and key signatures straight in their head. So let's find some of these terms first. First, what is a key? So a key tells you two main things. And uh, it tells you first what the tonal center is. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me show you. So if you're in the key of C, right? C major, C minor, doesn't matter. What that is telling you is that the tonal center is also C. Which means you generally the beginning and ending points of the piece or example or scale will begin and end or center actually around C. So if you're in the key of D, whether it's major or minor, tonal center will be, of course, you know, D right there. Or if it's B flat, the tonal center will be B flat. So that's the first thing it tells you. The next thing uh, that it does tell you is, uh, it also tells you, the other thing it tells you, of course, is what sharps or flats are in that piece or example, or even if you're looking at a scale. So say we have the key of C. Now, I know you don't know this yet, or maybe you do know this, that the key of C has zero sharps and zero flats. We're going to get to that part a little bit later. But remember that it also tells you that the tonal center is C. So we're going to be beginning and ending on that note and playing all of the notes in between that are not sharped or flat. So all the white keys. So the key of C just happens to have zero sharp zero flat so that's what the key tells you is the beginning and ending note basically and which notes are in between that just to kind of simplify it now it's different for every key and that's something what a lot of students struggle with we're going to talk about that like i said as we go along in the lesson but like the key of g right what is the tonal center of the key of g well that's going to be g of course so if i play g and also, you might not know this already, but the key of G is one sharp, F sharp. So I'm playing from G up to the next G. And I'll have an F sharp in there. So that's what the key of G tells me and what it's going to look like on the piano. Next, we're going to talk about what is a key signature. Okay, the key signature is a grouping of sharps or flats in the beginning of a piece. And what that tells you, it's a visual representation of the sharps or flats that exist in that key or in that piece. Now the thing is, is that it doesn't necessarily tell you what letter key you're in, and I'll explain this in a second, but it tells you what notes are sharp or flat throughout that piece. And one thing I want to mention is that you will have either sharps or flats. You will never have, um, you know, a key signature with sharps and flats. So let's take a look at some examples here. First here, I want to show you this is what the key of C looks like. There is nothing at all written anywhere in the beginning of the piece that tells you any sharps or flats. So whenever you see that, you're talking probably about the key of C or a key of A. Now, let's take a look here at another key signature, or one that we can actually see. So C, we have four sharps now right before the time signature comes in right here between the treble clef and the bass clef. Now you only need to read one clef or the other clef because the notes are actually the same. So what this is telling you is that say I have, uh, there's four sharps here, um, you know, and if I draw a note where each of these sharps is, you would have the note F, C, G, and D. And what that tells me is that throughout this piece, whether, uh, unless it tells you in the middle of the piece otherwise, that all Fs, all Cs, all Gs, and all Ds are sharp, even if they're not written in. But, like I said, think about, the actually the key name for this is the key of E. But the confusing thing, right, is that we have the four sharps, F, C, G, and D. You know, so where is the E in that? So like I said, the key signature itself doesn't tell you what key you're in, but you can use a trick to figure out 
what key you're in with a given key signature, which I'm going to talk about right now. Okay, like I said, next we're going to talk about how to figure out what key you're in if you have a key signature with sharps. So there's just two steps to this. Number one, go to the last sharp in the key signature. That's the one all the way to the right. And then you want to move up one half step. Now I'm going to show you uh, what I mean by that. So let's take a look. Okay, we have our four sharps here, right? And like I mentioned before, we have F, C, G, and D. And now what I meant by go to the last sharp, the one all the way to the right, is the one all the way to the right, which happens to be D sharp. Let me move that down so you can see it. That's D sharp there at the end. This is the key to figuring out what key you're in. So you play D sharp on the piano. Or you can think about it in your head if you know the layout of the piano. And you go up one half step, which is just to the next, also called a semitone, up to the next note above it. And what note is that? Hey, that is an E. So we are actually in the key of E. So remember the, key, the two steps are go to the last sharp and then go up a half step or semitone on the keyboard. Now let's try another sharp key signature. Okay, this time I only got two sharps. So what key am I in? Well, what do I have to do first? Think about it. Think about it. You have to go to the last sharp, the one all the way to the right. And if I had a note there, that would note would be C sharp. So you find C sharp on the keyboard. This is step two. And you go up one half step. And there you go. So that is D. The key of D has two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. We're going to do one more of the sharps. I think you probably get the idea. We're going to do one of the trickier ones. Let's do that. All right, let's talk about this key signature we have here. So step one, what do you do? You go to the last sharp. Boom. And if I had a note there, the note would be E sharp. Always put sharp at the end when you're dealing with sharps. So the weird thing about this is you have E here, right? Well, E sharp is right here. So, what do I have to do now? I have to go up one half step or one semitone, but this time, the strange thing is it ends up on a black key, which none of the other ones do, at least so far. So, the answer to this is that the key at F sharp is the one that has these six sharps. F, C, G, D, uh, A, and E. Okay, next we're going to talk about what, figuring out what key you are in for a flat key signature. Now, it's a little bit different, but I have good news for you because it's easier. So all you have to do is you go to the next to last flat. So you go to the last flat, you go one over to the left, and that is your answer. So let us take a look at uh, exactly what I mean here. Actually, I'm going to bring up the piano for us because I think that'll be helpful. All right, let's bring this to a flat key signature. The first thing I have to tell you, though, well, actually, let me bring that up a little bit later. We have two flats. You go to the last flat. Boom. Then what do you do? Do you then you you go to the one actually next to that. So if you only have two flats, you jump over to the one next to the left, which happens to be the first one in this case. But if you had more flats, it would be just the one right next to the one on the end. Okay, and that's B flat, right? So if I had a note there. B, since we're talking about flats, I'm going to write a flat. And, oh, oh, hey, look, that's the answer. B flat, the key of B flat has two flats, B flat and E flat. All right, let's try another key signature. Uh-oh, this time we only have one flat. So let's go through this together and figure this out. So remember I said, step one, you go to the next flat flat. Well, there's a problem here, isn't there? What's the problem? There's no next to last flat. There's only one. So what do you do? Well, I there's probably some trick to giving you uh, to figuring this out. But all I have to say for this first one is just remember that the key is F. That's it. That's all I have to tell you is that that's the one you'll have to memorize. Is that the first one's F? And all students that tell this can remember this. The first one's F, and then after that you can use the trick. Okay, 
let's take a look here. We have another flat key signature. So step one, what do you do? You go to the last one, right? The last flat. Oh, you go to the next to last flat, which happens to be in this case. Uh, let me get the pen situated here. In this case, happens to be a D flat, of course. So always put a flat next to it if you're talking about flats. You play D flat on the piano, and that's it. Got him. <laughs> you got the answer. So D flat is the key with five flats, a B, E, A, D, and G. Okay, here we have changed key signature to seven sharps. That is the maximum amount of sharps that you can have. So we're talking about right here. One thing I want you to notice about sharp key signatures is that there's an order to how they add the sharps. Every key has all of the sharps of the key before it. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Well, this is what I mean. So the first key with one sharp is, well, if that's the only sharp, remember you go up, and that's the key of G right there. So that's the one with one sharp. The key with two sharps, and the, by the way, that's F sharp. The key with two sharps has these two sharps, F and C. And then the one with three has the same two from before plus this next one, F, C, and G. The next one has F, C, G, D. The one with five has F, C, G, D, A. F, C, G, D, A, E is the next one. And uh, I've really made a mess of this. And then the last one, F, C, G, D, A, E, and B. So it's actually important that you memorize this order of sharps. Now remember this. I don't have it written down. You'll have to, you'll have to write it down. F, C, G, D, A, E, B. Now, why is this helpful? Well, think about if you don't have the key signature written in front of you and say you have four sharps. Well, what do you do? Well, all you have to do is count the first four, and I have it memorized already, the first four in your order of sharps. Remember, it's F, C, G, and then you stop at D. Those are the four sharps that you have in this key. And say you need to figure out what key you're in also. Well, you go to the last sharp you said, which is D sharp in this case. And then you actually go to the piano if you need to. And you go up one half step, that gives you the key of E. So that's the secret to figuring out if the key signature is not written out in front of you. For step one, say your order sharps, as many sharps as you need. So if you only have two sharps, you say F sharp and C sharp. And then you go up one half step from the last one you said, and that's it. Now with flats, there's another order to it. Let's talk about that. Okay, here we have changed key signature to the one with all flats. There are also seven flats that you can possibly have. Now the order is B, E, A, D, G, C, F. B, E, A, D, G, C, F. It's actually the order of sharps in reverse because the order of sharps was F, C, G, D, A, E, B, or if I this B, E, A, D, G, C, F. So it's flipped around if you want to make it a, a little bit easier. All right, now, with that said, if you have the one with two flats, the key with two flats, those two flats are B flat and E flat. In fact, the name of the key in that case is, of course, B flat, the next to last one you said. Now, what if I have one with five flats? And I don't have this written here at all. I need to figure this out from scratch. Well, I'm going to do, say, the first five of my order flats, B, E, A, D, G. What was the next to last one I said? D flat, right? And because we're talking about flats, you want to go to D flat instead of D. So D flat has five flats, B, E, A, D, and G. You're very welcome, Fire Flower. Okay, that's the end of the main part of the lesson. So what I want to do before I do the outro or anything, because we do have uh, some time left for sure, is I want to know what questions do you have about sharps or flats. Let me take a look. Which had one um, from earlier. Rich says, uh, uh, Tim, "Rich says Tim, did classic composers use key signatures? I believe they did." Um, in fact, I don't know. Let's look it up. I don't want to give you wrong information. It has happened before, and people let me know about it for sure. Uh, but I'm pretty sure. Um, 
Wow, the first thing that uh, came up was, did classical composers do drugs? I swear I did not search that on my own, and I don't know why uh, it came up first. But did classical composers, and I can't answer that question either. Um, they probably, some of them probably did. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, did classical composers use key signatures? I mean, I think they did. Uh, how about this? Let's look at a original Beethoven manuscript. Okay, uh, I forgot to tell you that Beethoven's handwriting is so bad that I don't even like understand how people figured out what he was trying to write. Um, which is why a lot of times different additions to things, uh, have it. So this, this manuscript's pretty early. I'm not, I can't tell you for sure if this, this looks like it probably was, uh, from early on. But yeah, there are definitely, you can definitely see that there are three sharps, uh, clearly written in that example. All right, uh, that's all right. Uh, sheet. Yikes! Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. Define classic notation evolved. A song like Moonlight Sonata doesn't come from a sober person, says DJ OJ West Coast. OG West Coast. Well, some of them had uh, legitimate mental. Problems and actually a lot of them did have problems with alcohol um, as far as I know And syphilis apparently apparently a lot of the classical composers had syphilis All right, let's take a look here All right, um all right, nobody has any questions about key signatures or anything. Let me kind of tell you what's coming up in the pipeline uh, right now. So let's take a look here together. So piano lessons on the web.com is my website. You feel free to go over there. And on the website, there's a free section. If you look at the top of the page, it says community. You click on that community tab, and it brings you to this free page for the live stream attendees. Now, I have to spend some time. Uh, filling this out, as you can see, a lot of them just say community Q&A. But that's what I want to let you know, is that over on the community page on pianolessonsonweb.com, we have the calendar of when we're meeting and what we're talking about. A lot of times I'll, you know, chart out in advance, maybe a month or two, of what we're talking about. The reason it's not filled out right now is we're taking off next week, uh, really so I can craft some ideas on the next lessons to come. I have a, still a list of some great lesson ideas, but it's always good every once in a while to kind of step back and really analyze and think about, you know, with the different types of lessons I've been making, which ones are working, which ones maybe not, and then which ones to, you know, experiment with. Because some of my best lessons were ones that I didn't think, um, you know, some of them were planned, but some of them I didn't think would do so well, but ended up doing that. So uh, I will be doing that uh, after Sunday. Sunday, we still are meeting at our usual time. We're talking about the circle of fists, the minor key signatures explained. So it, the I believe I put it in the description of this lesson, but if I didn't, go and uh, go on YouTube after the lesson's over and search um, circle of fifths lessons on the web. And that lesson is actually supposed to be a sequel to this one. This one was just to introduce you to key signatures and everything that one really goes into the nitty-gritty um, and also gives you the same kind of tips on how to figure out what key you are in uh, this next one on sunday is actually more of a sequel um, to that lesson so we have the prequel that lesson is the one you want to watch next that circle of this one and then we have the next lesson uh, after that on sunday and then we're off the next week, um, and then we're probably on the next week after. So check back on this page uh, in the next few days, and there will be updates as to what we're talking about and when.
Okay, let's take a look here. Sean asks, what time are you starting your lessons? Uh, the ones I do here on YouTube, we start 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, Sundays and Fridays. In terms of my other lessons that I do, uh, I do those uh, pretty much at any time. Let's see, Nuna says, hi, from France. Hello, Nuna. She says, I just got home and using through, so I don't know how productive I'm going to be. Well, that's okay. Luching door, yeah, from what I've seen. Oh, our base, uh, yes. So the key signatures between the base clef and treble clef are always the same. Always the same. I've never seen it be anything different. Oh, Sean says, sorry about the language earlier, but what time are you starting your live lessons? Uh, are we starting them at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? So uh, to put that in context, you can first of all just type in Google if you don't live in the same, um, what is that called? Time zone. As I do. Uh, but what you can also do is consider that we started half an hour ago from right now. So whatever half an hour ago is for you, uh, that's when we go on uh, Fridays and Sundays. And uh, th there's an automatic thing now on YouTube that like kind of flags your comment uh, if you use inappropriate language. So it's a little bit even more strict than I would. The word you use is generally okay with me. I don't like people spamming that word too often, but uh, I would have let it go, but unfortunately the automatic system and then Rich uh, took care of it as well. So let's see. Emmanuel says, I need to play a song like this. Can you explain it? 4-4 four, four, uh, at 140 cut time. Well, it can't be cut time and 4-4. Four, four, because what, four, what cut time means is that you're cutting all the note values in half. Cut time would really be the key signature 2-2. Two, two. Okay, Drew says, I'll watch the next one. Sounds like you got it answered there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let me show you exactly what lesson I'm talking about. And then, okay, so what you want to do is you want to type in circle of fifths lessons on the web. Like I said, I think I put uh, something in the description, but I forget. Uh, the first lesson that pops up. It's me. It's the circle of fifths. That that one from four years ago with the green title there. Eh, that one's okay. Uh, I made that a long time ago. I don't really. I don't like watching uh, a lot of my old videos. I mean, they're okay, but I like the newer ones better. Okay, Lechingador says thanks because I found an online resource where they were written differently. Yeah. Um, in any kind of practical case where you're playing piano, you're gonna always have the same key signature between treble clef and bass clef. It had dip parts in different keys. Well, what could happen is you can have dip... Now, you can be playing in a band, and in that band, you can have uh, the script written in different keys. And that's because different instruments... I don't understand why, still. <laughs> different instruments are transposed to different keys, so like... Uh, if you're playing a E flat saxophone and you're playing a C on that, it's not the same as a C on the piano. Like C, the uh, piano's concert pitch, but those are transposed. I don't understand why this happens. It's really, really annoying. But in a uh, in a band or a group, you can definitely have different key signatures between the different parts or different members uh, of that band. Okay. Oh, that's all right. Shade says, I'm so sorry. Friday's class is usually tricky for me. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, the stream's on Saturday, though. Okay. Gary says, uh, I saw a bass clef in front of a group of notes in the second measure after the treble clef in your lesson on playing with both hands. Does that mean you cross your hands uh, over to play the bass clef notes? Um, not always. That can mean a number of things. It can have notes that go below. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions here. I'm only going to answer maybe a couple of these because they are a little off topic and they will be uh, difficult to explain some of them. But let's take a look here. I can't explain this though. Okay, the like the double bass clef. Um, so hold on.
Okay, so here I have double base cleft. Base cleft up top, base cleft on the bottom. Now to figure out whether you're crossing hands or not, solely depends on are the are the right hand notes on the top staff going lower than the base cleft notes on the bottom staff. In this case, they are because with my let's uh, show you here with my left hand I have this D right here, and with my right hand I actually have a B lower so in this case I will be crossing my hands if it's the other way around where the right hand note is higher and the left hand note is lower no need to cross okay Barbara says is uh, teacher said it was an innovation of the composer it could be for that piece so uh, if you were literally it, like if it's a singing piece, you wouldn't have that transposition problem. I was thinking more of a band thing for some reason. Um, but yeah, that could definitely be something the composer is trying to do. Uh, let's take a look here. Sean says, uh, what, what about the other time since you're really helpful? Almost master all the circle fifths. Okay, and bass clef. Uh, I'm not sure which one you mean. Do you mean 4-4? Four, four? Okay, I'm going to answer Arm Deep's question. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get all the, to all these questions, unfortunately, uh, but I'll get to as many as I can. Uh, Arm Deep says, can you demonstrate the fingering for the F major and B major scales, please? Yeah, the normal, key, the normal fingering will not work for those. So for F major, the key signature for your right hand will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, and then if you're stopping up there, you can just end on four. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. However, if you're doing a double octaves or more than one octave, you do one, two, three, four, one, two, three. When you're about to hit four again, you cross under and hit one, and you continue the pattern. Two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So it repeats like that. Left hand, the fingering for F major scale is the exact same as C major, G major, all the ones you've done so far. Five, four, three, two, one, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one, three, two, one. If you continue to keep going. Uh, and then for B major, the, here's the fingering for the right hand. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one. Now that's, I think that's the same as the other keys. However, with the left hand, you want to start with four. It's four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. Just like that. And then in reverse, going down the other way. All right, before I answer some more questions... Uh, sorry, the cable was getting caught underneath the chair. Uh, I want to mention a few things for anybody who is new out tonight. Okay, I have a website, pianolessonsontheweb.com, and if you like what you see over here on the YouTube channel, you're really going to like what you see over there because I have over 25 courses that I've made all designed to help you learn piano music theory, improvisation, sight reading, ear training, pretty much anything that I felt you needed uh, to be a well-rounded musician. Think of it as like a little online music school for you. So it has the same types of lessons that you can expect from the channel. This my same style of teaching. I teach uh, most, all but one of the courses, actually. One of the courses I had somebody help me out with, but I teach pretty much all the courses, so the same kind of style uh, you can expect in these courses. Uh, they're for be beginners, so if you are brand new to the channel or if you need a review on the beginner stuff, there's a lot of stuff there for that. There's lessons for intermediate students and courses and lessons for advanced students as well. But in addition to the videos, you get actually a lot more than that. You get printable sheet music examples, assignments, uh, activities, and a lot of other things to enhance your learning much beyond YouTube. So feel free to take a look around at what courses we have. As you can see, you have a browse courses right there. One thing I want to tell you, though, is that you can purchase courses either in uh, individually, as you scroll down there, you just pick one out of the list, but you can also get them in course packs and get a good deal. So you can check out, you know, view each pack, see the courses that are included uh, in there, and you can get a 
good deal on it. So I highly recommend you go to pianolessonsontheweb.com to see the many courses that we have to offer. So thanks, everybody. I just want to let you know about that. All right, let's see what we got here. Hey, Arm Deep, you're very welcome. Ice Mike says, I'm here. A welcome out, Ice Mike. All right, let's take a look here. Love the topic. Going to sign uh, out for questions. See you next time. All right, thank you very much, Drew. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. So hopefully you enjoyed it. And I'll see you hopefully on Sunday. Okay, so like with this example with seven flats, uh, I know C flat major or A flat major. So it will be, so with seven flats, Remember that the order flats is B, E, A, D, G, C, F. But this time you go to the next to last one. So it actually happens to be C flat. Ice Mike says, awesome. All right, thank you, Ice Mike. Do you teach a tenor and alto clefs? Uh, I can. Um, I don't know how how important that is for piano players because to be honest except for music school and they wanted to drive us crazy i didn't have to use it but you know what i'm going to give you a really quick rundown on how this works so how any of the other clefs work let me show you is that whatever note is in the middle of that clef you see how it's like right in the middle of that staff that's c and you just count up and down from there to figure out what notes you have here so this would be C, A, A, C. Oops. Actually, it would be C, A, B, C. So you can think of it perhaps maybe like the bass clef, except all the notes are shifted down one. So, you know, if normally if it's a D on bass clef, it'll be a C. If it's an A, it'll be a G in the uh, alto clef. So you can think about it like that. The Or the tenor clef. No, that's alto. The tenor is similar except oops the middle is in a different place so it is now why didn't that change oh that changed over here man that's not what i wanted Okay, here we go. It's the same deal, except now C is right here. So you can think about it then being like the treble clef, but the notes are shifted down one. So instead of a D in treble clef, that would be a C. Thank you very much for answering that, Rich. I just can't get to everybody tonight, but I do appreciate all the questions uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, Crossbeats Music Production says, can you give a brief explanation of sus2 and sus4 chords? Of course I can. That's easy enough. Hi, also. Okay. Uh, let me bring us back to, like, a normal clef or key signature. Oh, by the way, this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> in case you're like, what what in the world is he doing? Okay. By the way, one thing I want to mention is that when you have a key signature in the middle of a piece and then you go to the key of C, like if you ever modulate or change key to the key of C, that's designated by a natural, putting a natural over any of the previous flats or sharps. So that's actually what the key of C looks like because uh, it's canceling out all of those. Okay, so let's take a look here. Uh, Sean says, thanks, awesome lesson. awesome lesson. Hope to make it next time. Thank you, Sean. All right, so sus2 chords. Let me explain this on the piano first. So you know your triads, probably, if you're here asking this question. So a triad is a three-note chord as a root, the name of the chord you're on, so C major. And then you have a third and a fifth, evenly stacked just like that. All a sus2 chord is, is that instead of playing the root, which is also known as the one, you know, these are all based on numbers of the scale. You have one, three, and this is the fifth note. So you are replacing a two, wait, uh, did you ask a two, one uh, thing? 
sus2, okay, sus2, here you go. So a sus2 is when you take the 1 out. You only have the 3 and the 5. And you replace the 1 with a 2. And you play all those notes together, and that's a sus2 chord. Now one thing I want to mention is that a, a lot of times the D, or a lot of times the uh, 2 will res call was, bleh, is what's called resolving to 1. So you have 2, 3, 5, and that almost goes to 1 always. You can always make pretty cool songs. So you can make some pretty cool songs with some sus2 chords. Sus4 chords, actually let me write a sus2 chord real quick. Actually, I did a perfect first try, but let me write the C major triad. You take the C, and you move it up to D, and boom, that's it. Now let's talk about a four, uh, sus four chord you were asking about. So this time, we're going back to our triad, and we're doing this. We're changing out the three for a four instead. And then a lot of times, that note will move back into place where it is. So two, uh, two sus two. I call them uh, two one suspensions, and then a four suspension sus four will be like that. All right, uh, Tim, can you play a, a church hymn that has chords in both hands? Explain your tips on knowing which fingering uh, you would use in order to play smoothly. Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can do that. I'd prefer to make a lesson on it, but let me take a look. So if you don't know, a Bible hymnal is a group of church songs, basically. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not because I want you to go to church or anything. It's because the uh, the pieces are very, very good for doing sight reading. Okay, here we go. So, I don't know. Let me kind of play through this first line, figure out what I'm doing. Right away, I'm uh, the first thing I want to tell you, we've gone over this before, Rich, is determine the range of notes. Right? So, in each hand, what is the lowest note to play with the right hand? What is the highest note to play with the right hand? Same thing with the left hand. So, in this case, it looks like that B there is like as low as I need to go, and it goes up as high as this B for this first line. So, that's my range. I'm generally just going to keep my hand around that width and being re ready to play the notes in between. You're, it wouldn't make any sense for my thumb to be going anywhere below that note or my pinky to be going anywhere above uh, that one. All right, here we go. So with the right, I'm going to do the right hand first. So I'm not going to start this with finger one, right? Because I have to play, you know, these, tr these, these thirds down here. So like I said, I'm just going to keep my thumb where it is. Now that I wasn't happy with that fingering at the end. So a lot of times you have to go over and revise your fingering. One thing I'm not necessarily going to do right now because I don't have it set up to do this is that you want to write in your fingering as you figure it out. This is very, very important because to really put fingering into practice, you really need to use that fingering over and over and over and over again. And the best way to do that is to actually write it in. But let me continue experimenting around. Now I remember that this part, I ran out of fingers up here, so I'm going to try a different finger on that D and G in the last measure. Perhaps you actually can't see that. Like that. Oh, and hey, I had enough fingers to do it. And yeah, that worked out perfect. And then I go through and I do the same thing with the next line. Now, and I'm going to do this hand separate with the fingering because it doesn't make sense to try to figure out both fingerings at the same time. 
So now I'm looking at the range here. It looks like the highest note I have is a D. The lowest I want I have is a D down here. So I'm going to keep my hand in this general uh, range. Uh, yeah, I would always write in your fingering unless it's super duper obvious. Like if it's a scale or something, a C major scale in the middle of a song, you already know that fingering probably. So uh, probably no need. Or if it's like a standard, you're sitting in a five finger position and you're not moving out of there anywhere, then uh, you probably don't need it as much. But, you know, if you, especially if you feel like you need it and you feel like the song isn't quite coming together right, then absolutely I would write in the fingering. And I really don't have a problem with writing in fingering too much, like I would with notes. Notes, you do not want to write in notes unless you're just starting out. Uh, but the fingering, it probably a little bit on the, the overindulgent side would probably be even better, I think. So yeah, I would most times write in your fingering. Like I say, unless it's really obvious. And I didn't like that fingering at the end because I used repeated thumbs, and that's usually not a good thing. So I'm going to just start that note. So wherever you felt like you're getting off, um, you know, with your fingering, go to the chord maybe right before that and say, all right, maybe I'll approach this chord with a different fingering and then see if I can have enough fingering, enough fingers to finish out the line. So I think I have this figured out now. And that was a lot better that time. I still used a little bit of a repeat uh, thumb there. But like I said, I would actually write this out and play it over and over again until I felt like I had it. So those are just some quick tips for you. I know I can make a whole lesson on um, figuring this out. And then obviously different patterns, I would probably have different things to say. But there's a little uh, tidbit there for you um, for some practice tips on fingering. Cross Beast Promotion says, great, thank you. I appreciate that. You are very, very welcome. Fuddy Duddy says, I came late, but uh, I'm not getting notifications anymore. Oh, no. Why not? Are you still subscribed? That's one thing I would look for. YouTube claims that they never unsubscribe people from channels, but that's a lie because it happens. It definitely, definitely happens. Uh, it's a bug. And uh, for some reason, you'll subscribe to channels. And like after a few months, even if you use that channel like all the time, uh, it'll unsubscribe you for no reason. Rich says, thanks a lot, Tim. That helps you a lot. Yeah, so make sure uh, you do that. I also do a, um, if you go to my website, there's a little pop-up that comes up to join my mailing list. If you do that, if you're not joined already, uh, that will also, I'll give you a few days notice I'll send a, an email notification that we're meeting and what our topics will be. And then also, if you go to YouTube ahead of time, you can request YouTube to give you a uh, notification specifically for that video. Actually, one thing I just thought, what I want you to do is if, you're, if you find out YouTube has unsubscribed you, subscribe again. That's the problem. If you're subscribed and you're still not getting it, what you need to do is you need to unsubscribe you need to subscribe again and then turn notifications on after you have resubscribed. And from what I've heard that this resets the system and that it should work for you. But this is a very common problem, unfortunately, with YouTube. It's really frustrating. Yeah, just resubscribe, Fuddy Duddy. I think that'll work. All right, Rich says, I think you should do more lessons like this on fingering. Good fingering definitely makes playing easier. I'll definitely uh, note that. I will make some more lessons on fingering for sure. I actually need to figure out, because I'm taking off, uh, so we're still meeting on Sunday, like I mentioned, uh, but because we're taking off the next week, I need to find some video ideas and some things I can put out. Uh, because like I said, YouTube, the algorithm which you know ranks your videos and everything, uh, likes when you post three times a week. So uh, I'm probably going to be posting two or three videos uh, that week. Uh, so I need to figure out some shorter videos that I can make pretty quick. So where I still get to spend more time figuring out what the next lesson ideas will be, but still putting out content. 
Uh, Rich says, does anyone have YouTube Red? My free trial is ending. I didn't, you know, I still am confused as to what YouTube Red is about. I know it's like a subscription thing where I think you don't have to watch ads anymore or something. And I know I get paid a little bit from YouTube Red, but it's like nothing pretty much. It's like $2 a month or something like that. I forget. Uh, Crossbeat Music Production says, speaking of church music, is that something you learned to practice on? Um, I didn't practice much church music until uh, I started to sight read, learn sight reading. And my professor in college, uh, now I have been familiar with hymnals because I went to church you know, for a long time. But I didn't, uh, I never played them on piano. And uh, what got me into that was my professor in college said, if you want to get good at sight reading, you definitely want to pick up a church hymnal. And, uh, you know, play those because those chords to chord uh, kind of things are really good to practice for that. Oh, you can download the videos to watch later. I didn't know that. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Oh, we're almost at the hour here. So let me do an outro here. Uh, just to let you know, so this is how it's going to work from now on. The edited recording of this will be posted probably tomorrow morning, but sometime tomorrow. Uh, then, probably on Sunday, the day after, I'm going to post the entire recording of the live stream. Um, so, it, And that's because it takes a little bit of time, and I also want videos coming out on different days. I don't want a ton of videos coming out all on one day. I think, from what I've read... Uh, YouTube likes it when you spread it out a little bit. Um, so that's what's going to happen. Uh, Fight Day says, how do we contact you or give you ideas for websites with songs on them or anything else? Uh, you can email me, tim at lessonsontheweb.com. Um, let me think what would be better for that because I think that email is probably better for the website stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong, you can email me there, it's fine. Um, Facebook, you know, I'd go on Facebook, look up lessons on the web and send me a private message on Facebook. I think you might've done that already before Fuddy Duddy, but that probably would be one of the better, uh, ways for that. Uh, Manuel says, do you have a fun way to learn scales with fingering? I wish I had a fun way to do it, <laughs> but you just got to learn them. Eventually it becomes kind of fun because you get good at them and you can play them right away. But I, I hate to tell you, there's no fun way to do it. What I recommend, if you find it really tedious to practice scales, learn one scale at a time. You know, maybe once a week or, you know, one week you'll have uh, a goal to learn one scale. Don't try to learn them all at once and practice them all at once because that might burn you out if you find them boring but learn one scale at once really try to master the scales that you're learning uh, and go for like a fewer but more quality out of each one and i think you'll like it a bit better that way rather than going through you know c major d sharp or c sharp major d major of course i can play them pretty well to where that's pretty enjoyable but I can understand that at first it's not so fun. So I, what I recommend is just learning a few at a time, maybe one at a time, and trying to get uh, as good at that scale as you can. Huh, excuse me. Try to play scales with staccato in one hand and legato in the other. Okay. Whoops. Oops. Let me show you. Oops. Not bad, eh? Oops, now I gotta do. Not bad, eh? Oops. Hey, put it in contrary motion. Let me try like D major. It's a great brain exercise, I agree. Although I, I think I know them uh, well enough uh, f 
you know, for that to be too much of an exercise, but it would definitely be a great exercise if I haven't uh, mastered them already. But it is a, actually, it's a great exercise in hand control as well. So yeah, I guess in, in that brain, like that motor skills coordination kind of thing for sure. Manuel says, okay, thanks, bro. You're very welcome. All right, everybody, I'm cashing out for tonight. Uh, let me do this. Okay, if you want to learn more about how key signatures work, I have a perfect lesson and group of lessons for you. You want to check out this playlist that I recommend, and you want to subscribe because we have new great lessons coming out all the time. And you don't want to miss out. You want to hit that notification bell so YouTube actually lets you know what's happening. So thanks, everybody. This has been Tim from Lessons on the Web, and I'll talk to you real, real soon.